Guess what? We noticed the green was not the case of the videotape being uh, out of synchronization. <laughs> Morton Dean, training with the astronauts. Astronauts Truly and Engel are in the spacecraft. They've completed the deorbit burn. They are trying to position the spacecraft, and if I can use our small model of the spacecraft to give you an indication of what they're trying to do. They have been uh, flying upside down and backwards as they came through that deorbit burn. They are now trying to put the spacecraft, and in the process of putting the spacecraft in roughly this position, because remember, as they come into the Earth's atmosphere, tremendous friction and force underneath here. That's the reason they have these dark tiles all underneath the spacecraft, so it doesn't burn itself up. And they're positioning the spacecraft so when they come into the Earth's atmosphere, that this tremendous uh, heat will be deflected as much as it can be at roughly uh, this angle. They're in the process of doing that now. At about uh, 53 minutes after the hour, that would be, uh, oh, in the order of maybe uh, eight or nine minutes from now, they go into a communications blackout. Now, Bonnie Dunbar, uh, our astronaut, uh, one of the newer astronauts uh, who has been helping us throughout this uh, shuttle flight, explain to us briefly why they go into this communications blackout. What causes that? How long it lasts? And uh, does it indicate any special danger? Well, we go into a communication blackout uh, for reasons that are very much associated with the heat we're generating. If I can hold this up. Uh, we're generating a lot of heat because we have friction against the atmosphere. We have molecules of air that are essentially disassociating, separating. And that process is causing a communications problem. We just simply can't communicate through that type of environment. It's called a shield. It's uh, created. It's about 12 minutes long. There's no danger, it's just that we can't communicate uh, with them. We'll have our la last communication with them, I believe, right now through the Guam station, and then we'll next uh, reach them probably through Buckhorn coming into the United States. All right, let's explain that for just a second, that they are roughly now in, in an area over the Pacific Ocean, uh, past uh, Indonesia and New Guinea, and their next communication, main communication point uh, that they'll be using is over Guam. Uh, then they'll go into the communications blackout period for how long? About 12 minutes. Maybe 12 minutes. And then the next communication we'll be hearing is when they're preparing for the actual landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. That's true. You didn't mention the danger. I had said before that it, the silence, the 12-minute the communication blackout, doesn't indicate any special danger to the astronauts. No, there are periods on orbit where we may not be in, in contact with the crew for as long as a half an hour or longer. So I, there's no danger there. And our CBS News coverage of the return of Space Shuttle 2 continues after these messages. Without overstating it, the tension grows and the drama grows as the astronauts grow um, closer and closer to the time when they'll be landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. They're in contact with the Guam communications point now. They've removed the pins uh, in their seats in the cockpit uh, a step necessary because if it became uh, necessary for them to uh, eject from the spacecraft, they can only do that at below 100,000 feet. They'd have to have those pins out. All of this part of their scheduled routine. The next thing, uh, let's say the most uh, important thing that will happen in the next few minutes is that they lose communications. As uh, astronaut Bonnie Dunbar explained for us just a few moments ago why they lose that communication as the spacecraft faces that tremendous heat and force against uh, its bottom as it comes into the Earth's atmosphere. Let's pick up, we have about 34 and a half minutes to landing. We have roughly five minutes to the time when the astronauts uh, lose communications for about 12 minutes. Let's uh, pick up some of the voices, if we can, from uh, Mission Control in Houston, the scene that you're seeing now, the machines and people at Mission Control in Houston, and see if we can pick up some of their conversations uh, with the astronauts as the spacecraft re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, undergoes that tremendous force and heat uh, that puts the tiles to the maximum test on uh, the bottom of the spacecraft. 20 seconds, LOS. Uh, can you confirm whether the OEX recorder was configured uh, prior to seat ingress? Uh, that's the voice of Mission Control. Uh, I believe it was, Rick. The voice okay, of astronaut Joe Engel. We'll see you out of blackout and looking forward to seeing you there. 20 seconds to blackout time. Okay, Rick, and uh, we're pretty sure that the OEX recorder is on. Okay, thank you, Joe. See you in about uh, 20 minutes. Okay. Joe Engel, the flight commander, in communication Columbia with Mission Control in Houston. Configure LOS. Beginning to enter the blackout period. 
33 minutes until landing. We're into the shot control. Field. Guam has lost its signal. Columbia now 36 seconds away from entering the Earth's atmosphere and 32 minutes 47 seconds away from landing at Edwards Air Force Base. We're uh, 20 and a half minutes away from uh, being able to uh, talk to the crew again. All three uh, auxiliary power units up and running, looking good. As Columbia uh, passed out of range at Guam. The power level uh, looked great. The guidance officer said he saw runway 23 selected uh, into the uh, CRT on the instrument panel. You can see perhaps in our animation, uh, that is an animated version. We've had an update of what on the uh, uh, men of courage and talent in the cockpit nine. of Columbia are going through at this moment as the same, in uh, these seconds they are re-entering the Earth's atmosphere that, uh, second, uh, well, to me, almost fantastic today. heat generated in the bottom five of that uh, spacecraft. They'll be out of contact now for another uh, roughly 12 minutes. Uh, as they uh, out of communication, no way to get any communication either way, either mission control to them or they to mission control as they go through uh, that period of uh, um, uh, just an enormous heat to get themselves uh, through and uh, into the Earth's atmosphere, headed for their landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California, uh, out over the Pacific Ocean at the moment. And now that we're in the blackout period, let's go to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Morton Dean and astronaut uh, Paul Weitz. Dan, this is truly a great test of whether those tiles are indeed reusable, the 30,000 tiles that will keep the astronauts cool. Paul, when you were on Skylab and you begun to come through what we all call the fiery re-entry, do you sense the fire? Do you see it? You well, it? Let, let me... Uh things were a little different using the Apollo system because remember we really re-entered uh, the atmosphere back in first so that we were looking in the direction from which we were coming Mort and uh, consequently the entire ion sheath was flowing up around in front of our windows and we could see it even in the daylight what did it look like? oh it was beautiful it, it was a very tenuous uh, a pink color and it changed as you got deeper into the atmosphere it went uh, from a pink into a, an orange and even at times red. I remember talking to uh, Crippen and Young when they came back from their first flight and they did say that they could see, I believe, an orangey-like glow well, around the tip of the spacecraft. Yeah, what's different about this one is that it's coming in like an airplane, so you're coming in nose first, looking out the front end where most of, of this beautiful ion wake then is going to be behind you which you can't see and john said that as long as they were in darkness which they are now that they could see this glow this faint rosy glow around the uh, orbiter gradually increased but that as soon as they came into sunlight it was so tenuous that they could no longer make it out there there are according to my understanding is a symphony of special sounds when you're in a spacecraft uh, what did you hear i know crippen and young said they did hear some creaking and and uh, squeaking type sounds. Well, this is a much larger vehicle, and you would expect that as you got the thermal transients across the vehicle. In the Apollo Command Service Module, Command Module, in which we re-entered, it's a relatively small vehicle, and uh, there really was, was no sensible change outside of uh, changes as equipment and pumps came on and shut down inside the vehicle. Okay, thank you, Paul. Dan? Thank you very much, Morton Dean and Paul White's Bonnie Dunbar, astronaut here in Houston, you were explaining to me that as the spacecraft is in roughly uh, this attitude now, that the maximum heat is up in this area of the, of the nose cone? Uh, there are several areas of peak heating, but actually around the nose cap, which is called uh, reinforced carbon carbon, it's produced by Vought for uh, NASA, it sees about 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit on the uh, bottom and then other Say that again, 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit is the heat on that spacecraft right now. Capable of seeing about that temperature. And they're up at about uh, 340,000 miles above the Earth's surface.